Hello, hello, good morning. So this is going to be my talk and you're going to hear me hopefully. And uh, there was something on the base, but it's going better.
crois que c'est déjà là, en fait. Les gens sont pas là, ils vont vite. So we are getting started. And the room is called Melody, so you will not escape this. You know the ending, right? <laughs> I'll be uh, talking more about my kazoo this afternoon in the lightning talks. So, uh, this talk is on uh, asynchronous decision making. <laughs> My name is Bertrand de la Creta. I'm from the French speaking part of Switzerland. Been uh, involved in Apache for quite a long time, since the early 2000s. Um, it's all Gianugo Rabellino's fault. Um, I work for Adobe. We have an office in Basel in the um, content management space. We do large scale content management systems. Um, and we, it's, it, Adobe is a pretty distributed company. We have offices uh, in many places on the planet, and very often we work with other, you know, people from different offices. So obviously, it's uh, there's a lot of remote activities, and it's pretty similar in the end to open source projects and the SF. You're working with people from different countries, different time zones, um, different cultures. And there's lots of challenges uh, related to that. This talk is specifically on the asynchronous decision making, which is a key, I think it's the key element of uh, remote collaboration. And I, actually, I started from a talk which is more general on remote collaboration. And I, I, I was looking at my slides, OK, what shall I remove to, for, to the asynchronous decision making? And actually, I have left a number of elements which are a bit more general, but I think are, are relevant to that. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, <laughs> so I started being involved in the SF uh, around 2009, 2019, 2020. No, sorry, 1999, 2000. <laughs> Let me get my numbers straight. So more than 20 years ago. Uh, and, but very quickly, I was fascinated by the power of our communities. 
uh, I was independent at the time, working alone in my corner, and then you start collaborating with bright people, opinionated, <laughs> uh, lots of great ideas flying around, and you need to collaborate. So I, I started studying these topics. I'm not a psychologist, I, you know, I'm an engineer. So uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not a specialist in these topics, but I, I've been st I'm a pragmatic, so I wanted to understand what's going on. And I, this is one of my first talks on the topics in Amsterdam, ApacheCon 2008. Open source collaboration tools are good for you, so taking the tools angle. Today I will not go too deep in the tools because that we often disagree on the tools, <laughs> but uh, we can agree on the principles, and that's what we will uh, try to do. Then I had talks on, um, with a bit of a pro provocative title, I will not attend your meeting. I'm an open source person. And if, when you're working in a big organization, it's a good mindset to have. I, I'm known in my, uh, among my colleagues to reject meetings when there's no agenda, uh, where it's vague, what's going to happen. I say, you know, what's going, to, why are we having this meeting? Is it worth having it? Meetings are expensive. So this was a bit provocative, but for good, uh, for a good cause, I think. And then, uh, this is the first article I wrote on opensource.com on asynchronous decision making, um, which I think is really, really the key. How can you make decisions without having to meet synchronously? Uh, in, the, in the old times, it would mean meeting in person, but today, it, you know, you can meet on video. It's, it's almost as boring <laughs> if, if the meeting is not well organized, and it's, it can be very in inefficient, so we should be careful about that. So honing our decision-making or our asynchronous decision-making skills will help with that. Then I also had a few talks on the um, multicultural aspects, which get in the way. Clearly, we are talking with Francois about the, you know, the Swiss French and the Swiss Germans, or in Belgium, you have the, the, the Flamand and Wallon, I don't know the names in English. Uh, when you, you know, different cultures, even in, in a single country, slightly different cultures. But this, this makes it harder to understand each other. Or we think we understand each other, but in reality, we don't. Uh, so that, that's an important aspect of that, which is not directly linked to asynchronous decisions, but can get in the way of getting this process to work. And then I also had a talk, this was first backstage, on the conciseness and clarity. Because all of this happens in writing. So you need to, you need, your writing needs to be efficient. You need to be able to write concisely and clearly so, so that, you know, to grease the wheels of this uh, mechanism. So there are many challenges to um, remote collaboration. Asynchronous decisions is, is a key part of that. But there are many things that will influence the, the you know, how well or asynchronous decision-making processes work. So apologies, I see, you know, Rich, you've probably seen this 10 times. <laughs> so if you've seen some of my former talks, you will see the same slides, uh, some of them, same pictures, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's not a fully new angle on things, but it, it's evolving all the time. I'm still fascinated about it and, and trying to, to refine it. And also seeing the two aspects of the SF, which is, can be very chaotic, there's no boss, there's no central organization in a project, and compared to the corporate world, you know, working for a big company, uh, th there are similarities and there are challenges which are a bit different, but this helps in both cases, actually. These principles can work as well in an enterprise as in an open source community. So getting a bit more concrete, starting with the meetings. Uh, <laughs> I've had colleagues uh, ask me, Bertrand, I would like to have a discussion with you, but I know you hate meetings. Do you agree to have a discussion with me? I say, no, it's not that bad, you know, but in, in a big organization, people sometimes think that meetings will solve problems. And they can, but not necessarily. It's not the fact of having a meeting that will solve a problem. It's having a good meeting, which is very different. My father was a carpenter. Actually, I, I'm a, a son, father, and brother of carpenters. I'm the, you know, I'm the wrong person in this family. But uh, I, still, I still do some woodworking. The kazoo is 3D printed. It's not woodworking yet. Um, so my father was a carpenter. He had his, his workshop on the, on the first floor of the house, and we had the, the flat on the second floor. 
ground floor, first floor, whatever. Um, and very often, regularly, he was late for lunch. And the excuse was, uh, Dad is gluing a chair. And that's actually a perfectly valid excuse. If you start gluing your chair, and if you interrupt it, you, the chair is ruined. It will not work. You, ha you know, w once you start gluing the chair, you have to finish that phase so you can move forward with, with your project. In our work of software development, it's the same thing. You know, when you, when you get in the zone and you're doing something difficult, you need this uninterrupted period of two hours, three hours, whatever. If it's, if it's interrupted, it's lost, and we know that. So if you have a meeting at 2, at 3 p.m., before that, you, you don't start your thing. You know, I, I will not start this because I have to, to stop in, in an hour. It's too short. And after the meeting, only one hour left, I won't start this thing. So basically, your afternoon is kind of ruined just because you have a meeting in the middle of the afternoon. Paul Graham has an excellent blog post. You have a link here, um, which is called Make a Schedule versus Manager Schedule. If you're a manager, meaning if you're in meetings all week, if you have one more meeting, it's one more slot. One fortieth or whatever of your week, it's not much. If you're a software developer, if you're a craftsman, and we are craftsmen as software developers, uh, the meeting can run, ruin your afternoon or ruin, ruin your day, depending on how long and, and when it's placed. So that, that's a very important thing uh, in terms of the cost of the meeting. I would, li I would like to have parking meters in meetings, you know, and then you have to put money for the meeting to continue. And based on how many engineers, how, how much they paid, we get good salaries sometimes, uh, the, you know, the cost of the room, the, the aggravation of the people, and uh, the, the, this lost productivity of the makers, a meeting is extremely expensive. So you have to be very careful in scheduling meetings that are worth having. Meetings can be fantastic when you're brainstorming. I, I play some music and I, 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 I compare that sometimes to jazz improvisation. You know, you're in a small group that you trust and you can go anywhere and people will follow your thoughts and this can be fantastic. But, but some meetings, you know, the status meeting where you wait here and uh, for one twentieth of the meeting you say, yes, I did this and this and this and the others say, oh, that's cool. Uh, it's not a very good use of your time. You know, it can be, uh, there's also the social aspects of the meetings, which are important, but then maybe you have just social meetings, have a coffee meeting, a croissant, coffee and croissant meeting for the social thing, and then do the rest asynchronously. So meetings are very expensive, and we have to be careful, you know, use that, that cost um, efficiently. And there's many reasons where meetings can fail. You invited the wrong persons, you forgot to invite someone, the people didn't come, they're not prepared, they're not awake. Uh, you know, the, you can find tons of videos in, on the web about failed meetings, which can be quite funny. But when it's your company's money, it's not really funny. It's just a waste of time and money and, you know, a waste of people's energy. So I'm not a fan of... <laughs> People say I'm not a fan of meetings. I'm not a fan of bad meetings. I think meetings are very expensive, and you have to be careful to, you know, to, for a meeting to be worth it. It has to be prepared. It has, has to have a clear purpose. It has to, you know, have results. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of... We have to be very careful in how we use meetings. Asynchronous decisions help have less meetings. They come from the, uh, I discovered them in the open source world, because in the open source world, you cannot have a meeting. In most projects, it's not possible. Today, with video, it's easier, but if you have different time zones, it was very hard again. Or you will exclude some people if you have a meeting, because you have a meeting with the people who are in the same time zone, or, uh, you know, who can work with this time, and the others will be excluded. It's not good. So in, in the SF, uh, we used to have a rule that says if it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Meaning you have to document your decisions. Decisions have to, ha have to happen on a shared channel. And when you're creating software, it's tons of decisions all the way. What language? How do we structure the modules? How do we write this module? How much testing do we do? You're making decisions all the time. So it's very important for the decision process to be uh, efficient. I see four phases in a decision. You start by brainstorming, just, you know, throwing good ideas in the air, or even bad ideas, doesn't matter, throwing ideas in the air and catching the ones that fly. 
uh, more or less. It's not very important this time. You just create a corpus of ideas. Then, second phase, you refine them into a set of manageable options. Ideally, three, five, seven options, not more, uh, you know, which seem to be valuable, possible, realistic, somewhat. You don't know yet, but you try to reduce this to a manageable set. Then you build consensus. Ideally, uh, consensus emerge. You discuss, and, oh, yeah, no, this option clearly looks better. So we choose one. Or maybe you reduce that with two options, with a consensus. And ideally, you, you, you agree on the best option. If you don't, you need a mechanism to break this tie. In, a, in the SF, we have the voting rules. So you will vote to decide uh, which is the, the best option so you don't, you don't get stuck. You don't end up discussing forever and not making a decision. It's a bit frustrating when you vote because someone will lose the vote. So it's better if you can get a natural consensus, but it's not always possible. And it, when it's not possible, you want to move forward. So you need a mechanism to break the ties and make a decision. If you, even if it's not the best for everybody, at least you move forward. The tools that you need for that. So I said I, I don't want to go deep in the tools because we often disagree on tools. So I'm, I'm speaking the, about the tools in somewhat abstract terms. You need a broadcast channel, which everybody sees or hears, where you say, OK, we have to make a decision on what do we get for lunch, for example. And I'm taking the marine radio analogy. When you do uh, on a marine radio, you have a channel 16, which is broadcast, which everybody hears. And you have to be very careful how to use it. Use it, no, you know, sparingly, because it's, it's noisy for everybody. And then when you, if you call the Coast Guard on channel 16, they will say, OK, sir, can we uh, switch to channel 11? Because, so to free the broadcast channel and discuss your topic in a separate uh, place. And this is the second tool, the case management tool which can be, you know, cardboard papers, maybe if you're in the same room, or post-its. You can do asynchronous decisions in a, in, in a single room, and it can be very efficient if you have a number of people. Usually we have better tools, digital tools, so uh, issue trackers typically, uh, GitHub issues, GitHub discussions work well for that, uh, Jira, Bugzilla, if that's what you have, whatever. But a, a place where you can have a single URL, a single page for a decision. And then that's where you discuss the details of this decision. And then maybe you report back on the broadcast channel when it's done. We decided this and this, a very short message. Details are in that page. So it's really, you really need just these two tools, a bit of abstract tools. Of course, we have efficient digital tools for that. Even if you don't have digital tools, this is, I used to work for the Swiss Parliament. And uh, this is the Swiss Federal Council. The S Switzerland is governed by seven people, a uh, council of seven people, and they work pretty similarly to the SF Board of Directors. I was on the board for a number of years, and interestingly, uh, the board meetings are very efficient, and uh, the Swiss Federal Council meetings are also very efficient. They take about 70 decisions in a four-hour meeting, which is super efficient, because everything is prepared in advance, asynchronously. It's kind of a hybrid meeting. They need to make the decisions in a formal way, because that's, they have rules which force them to do that. So they use a colored list. They, use, they have their agenda on paper, but they have four colors for these papers. So the orange list is the uncontested decisions, the ones we know we're going to agree on this. So the chancellor says, uh, can, can we agree on everything that's on page one? Any objection? No. OK, done. 20 decisions made in two minutes. Apache Board of Directors work in the same way. Uh, with uh, its text file, it's, you know, it's digital, but it's very similar. We, you prepare the decisions in advance to know which ones are easy and which ones are harder. So the colors, uh, for example, the white list is for the harder de decisions, where they know they're going to fight or it's going to be harder, take more time. So you know, we get rid of the easy ones first, so, uh, 50 decisions made, and then you have two hours to discuss the three ones which are harder which is really nice, just with colored lists on paper. <laughs> Interestingly, I wrote the software at the time that they used to, to man manage this agenda, and it took me 15 years to realize that it was the same way, uh, same mechanism in Apache board and as in the Swiss Federal Council. Go figure. But it's really, it was really interesting to, to see that in, you, would, you could say old-fashioned, you know, government, they have very old processes and stuff, but they work in a very similar way to have 
as much as possible of the meeting manage asynchronously in advance. And then you keep the meeting for the really important parts. I'll still speak a little bit about the tools, but it's not, it's not to focus on the specific tools, but what, what properties you need in these tools. Uh, here I'm taking this example I think I, I got from Rich, the OpenStack dev list. It's a plain old mailing list, very simple you know, uh, infrastructure, but they use tags in the subject lines. So it's tagged discussion threads. So you have threaded discussions, which allows you to very quickly scan the subject lines and ignore the ones that are not relevant to you. Maybe in the morning you come, you have 100 new messages on the mailing list, and you can just scan the subjects, new, neutron, not interesting for me, ignore, ignore, ignore. Oh, this one is for me. You know, you can se se select the three discussions that interest you out of maybe 50. Because they are tagged, because they have expressive subject lines, because you're being careful, uh, your community is being careful. Uh, in a more, more modern tool, I like to use uh, GitHub discussion pages or GitHub uh, issues also using tags. So it allows you to classify them and define categories and you know uh, that one category might be more important for you or irrelevant, helps you, you know, cope with this mass of information you're getting and, you know, uh, ignore as much as you can because it's not relevant to you. Chat. Chat is a big <laughs> topic in this space. Uh, so many people uh, would love to collaborate on Slack today uh, or other chat systems. Chat is really designed for here and now. It's great for war rooms. You know, you have something to do in real time. It's a fantastic tool for that. For the asynchronous work, I find chat very hard. If you, I, I do sailing, so I will go away for one week, be out of anything, and then you come back and you have this pile of, uh, you know, vaguely in disorganized messages in the chat. It's super hard to keep, uh, you know, to uh, catch up with it. Whereas if you, if you have structured decisions with, with very good subject lines, as we saw, that's much easier, and then that becomes possible. So I'm not saying chat is bad. I'm, I'm saying chat is good for the here and now. It could be a good complement to discuss you know, things, and then the more structured things go into the decision page. And then once the decision page is done, once the decision is done, it goes back to the broadcast channel. Have a kind of a hierarchy of tools of communication channels. Shared documents can work if you are if you are in a in an environment where people don't have many di digital tools. Say, well, okay, we're using shared Google Docs or SharePoint, uh, and maybe one document per decision or a document for a group of decisions that can work, and it's very accessible to people who are not geeks, because this this thing works. You know, it's not only for software; you can use it in any collaborative project where you need to work remotely. So again, back to the abstract tools. You need a broadcast channel so that everyone can figure out what's going on without the details, and then the details go in the case management tool, issues, discussion pages, shared documents, whatever, where you have one, one, one room, if we want to say, per, per decision, so one page, ideally. Um, I'll brief, so I would be at the end of the time, but I think we started five minutes later. Is that correct? Okay, so I have five more minutes. So I'll be, be a bit quick, but uh, I'll be concise and clear. Uh, I use, uh, when, when we watch movies at home, I use IMDb often to, to check out if the movie is any good. I like their structure, which is a multi-level structure. You have the title of the, of the movie. Maybe you already see the title and say, this is not for me. Yeah, you know, okay. Move, move, move on to the next one. Then you have an abstract, at the, the synopsis of the movie at the bottom of the page here. Then you can watch a trailer. So it's a multi-stage, multi-level expression of what the movie is. And at each level, you can decide to read on or not. Maybe you're already put off by the title or, oh, the title, okay, no, whatever works, sounds interesting. Is that that's Woody Allen? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you, you pieces of information help you make a decision. You can make the you can do the same in your uh, new, uh, digital messages on on these channels. Oh, no, I don't want to do a software update right now. <laughs> Please not. <laughs> um, and this is a message I wrote to the ASF board. This it's not confidential, so it's fine. 
and it is multi-level. The subject line says what it's about. Website. Not interested in website? Okay, I ignore this. No worries. And and it says what the message is about. It's not uh, the the worst subject lines or question or you know very vague things. You want to be precise. Then there's in the, uh, there's an the introduction. Section of the website is currently built from SVN. I want to move this to um, the main repository, whatever. A short short uh, phrase that allows you to decide, are, am I interested in this particular topic about the website? Second level of decision. Then I have all the details with the uh, links to the references. This message is mostly self-contained. You know, you, you, won't, we, you will not need to exchange 10 messages to know what it's about. I've put all the information here in a multi-level format and including radiating intent, expressing what I'm going to do next. I'll wait for the discussion to settle, if any discussion, before committing my stuff and going, going, uh, you know, moving forward. Try to express everything in one message if you can. It will save a lot of back and forth. And, and including links to details, and with multi-level um, expressions, so people can decide if that's relevant or not for them. Being concise is very important. I will not read the text, but these two uh, paragraphs say exactly the same thing, except the left one is concise, and the uh, right one has a lot of noise. And when you're writing on a channel where 100 people are reading, it, you know, maybe writing the right one saves you five minutes because it's, it's easier to write, com complicated, you know, it takes more time to simplify. But then you will save the times for, from the 100 people who, who are reading. So you're actually doing your community a service if you, if you are concise. And this takes work. It's something you can work on. I, I loved the initial Twitter, when Twitter was good and had only 100, 140 characters. I would always give myself a challenge to write a message in exactly 140 characters. You know, reduce it to 140 and try to do it exact. It's a good exercise. You know, try, work on your writing. Great book on this, Radiating Intent. I'm a cyclist also and I'm alive because when I'm cycling, I'm very clear expressing what, I, what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn left, going to turn right. In Denmark, they do this to say I'm going to stop. It's super useful. You can do the same you know, in, in your work, like I did in the previous message, expressing your intent so people can object if, if they won't need to object. A great book on this, Turn the Ship Around, by someone who uh, applied the same principle in military setting, which is usually super hierarchical, but they say, no, uh, like the, the person who's driving the submarine will say, Captain, I intend to turn 10 degrees to port. Do you agree? You know. One exchange, yes, no, it's done. Instead of asking for permission in a complicated way, radiating the intent. Have two minutes, this is going fast. <laughs> Multicultural gets in the way. Uh, often when I do, so if I ask you what's your culture, people will usually say, I'm from Germany, I'm from Holland, I'm from France, whatever. And then I ask, are there any soccer fans? Yes, I, I, I'm clueless about soccer. And soccer is a culture. You, maybe sometimes you have jargon. Any drummers? Okay. Yeah, uh, two drummers. <laughs> you know, all these subcultures, they have their own codes and jargon and stuff. And we have to be careful uh, to, to make sure we, we understand each other. There's also a culture of engineers versus managers. Think differently, and, and this can lead to tensions. I will not have time to go into this, but I studied the Costa Concordia disaster. And it, there's a very big cultural aspect behind that. They had 38 nationalities on board. Official language was Italian because uh, the ship was under Italian flag. And the, the helpsman testified that he did not understand often the orders given in English by the captain. So a big mess of language, culture, stuff, which didn't help in this case, even though it seems that the captain did a big mistake. The aviation industry has a simplified English standard for their technical documentation. And I encourage you to use simplified English when you write on channels with, where, you know, where most of us, English is our second language. So if you use complicated, sophisticated English, we might not get it. So it's really useful to simplify. And it's interesting to read this exam you know, examples of this simplified language that they have in aviation so that uh, use a restricted version of English, keep it simple, don't be too clever when you write. You can always make the jokes over drinks later, but it, it's hard. And yeah, 
uh, culture gets in the way. Basic 101, how to avoid misunderstandings, assume good intentions, ask for clarification, reformulate, make sure you have understood. Written co collaboration is difficult. So it's good to um, work on your writing, be concise, be clear, take the time to write good messages because you're saving time for everybody who's reading. So globally, uh, at, the, at, the, at the team scale, you're, you're being very efficient. So this is what I had to say on asynchronous decisions. Uh, I think they are the key to, to efficient remote collaboration. The, the principles are pretty simple. Uh, have this broadcast channel where you advertise which decisions are being made, then move each decision to its own corner, own page, uh, issue decision uh, discussion page, page, and so on. I have a reading list. Um, uh, the slides will be online. On, I have this link to a press book where we have other talks on the same topics, more detail, longer, or shorter. There's various uh, uh, variants of, of them. And the four, phase of, four phases of the decision are important to realize. Brainstorming, reducing the options, getting consensus, and finally making the decision. I'll be here until the end of the afternoon. Happy to chat if you're around. And we have a few minutes for questions.